Welcome to Living from the Soul. This is Sam Tarod, and as you've probably noticed, I've been on break for a few months. I do hope to return with a new season of interviews this winter. But in the meantime, I'd like to share an interview that someone did with me. Amuro Atez interviewed me for his Recoding Behavior Program. I was grateful for the opportunity to talk about the seven spiritual principles of Ralph Waldo Emerson and to tell some stories about how I have tried to apply them in my life. We also delve into Stoicism and how to create a life vision statement. So thanks to Amuro for leading this conversation. Hello, everyone. Today I have author and artist Sam Torod with us. Welcome, Sam. Hey, Amuro. Thank you. Great to meet you. Uh, likewise. Sam, could you please share with us what is soul? What is your understanding when we talk about the soul and why is it so important for you? It's certainly a difficult thing to define the word soul. <laughs> what does that mean? I think it's beyond words, but uh, we, we can try our best. Sometimes it's something we just have a sense of it. You know, we talk about soul music or, oh, that singer has soul. Well, that means that they're expressing their deepest self, their deepest feelings, connecting with us on a heart level. So what I would say is that soul is our deepest essence, and it's a part of ourself that's not bound by time or place or the material world. It transcends all that. So we would call it spiritual because it's beyond the physical. But you might ask yourself, who am I? Who am I really at my deepest level? And you might think, well, am I my body? If that were the case, then which body am I? Was I the body I had at age three? Or the body I had at age 18? Was that who I am? Or the body right now? So our bodies are always changing. And we might lose an arm. We might have our hair turn gray. So is that changing who we are? No, we have this sense through our whole lives of being the same person, that same essence. And we might take different jobs over our life. So some people think, oh, I'm defined by what I do. But if they lose their job, then they might have a crisis of identity. So whether it's your job, your name, your nationality, all that stuff can change or is secondary. And it's, it's what is that core part of you that stays consistent throughout your life where you think, this is me, I am me, it deep inside. So that is what I would say is the soul. That is beautiful. That's so awesome that uh, I have never heard this way, the ex expression of a, a soul. Uh, my, take, uh, my takeaway is soul is the deepest feelings mm. and free from time, place, and transcendence. And it's primary, not secondary. It's primary mm. of our being. So th these are my deep notes uh, from your answers. Thank you again. Why is it so important? Why, why, why is it important for us? Well, I think connecting with that deepest part of ourselves is the only way we'll find happiness and peace and contentment instead of uh, chasing things outside ourselves, whether it's accomplishments at work or a certain partner we're, we're chasing or trying to be happy with, or of course, material possessions, cars and homes. We'll really only find peace and contentment when we connect with that deepest part of ourselves and feel that we're expressing it. I think that work is an important part of life because we need to feel that we're doing something meaningful, something that is really expressing ourselves. And that's what makes work meaningful is when we can connect with our soul and express that. So the, you're saying that uh, the way to ha be happy, fulfillment, and being content, and also expression of your being is very related with soul. That's, that's crucial for our being. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and being yourself, you know, not trying to fulfill the expectations other people have or do what you think will make you popular, but uh, really uh, living as yourself. Can you give me an example, like a, your personal life, like this was it, you know, this is, has nothing to do with the expectations from the uh, social norms. I do what I feel. Can you, do you have something like a, a solid something that we can share with our listeners? 
Mm. The first thing that would come to mind is years back, I had a very solid job at a magazine. I was a designer of a monthly magazine. And at the time I got that job, that was exactly what I wanted. The, it was a conservative religious magazine that agreed with my beliefs at that time. But then as four years went by, my beliefs changed and I no longer agreed with the magazine. And I decided it was more important to part ways and take the risk of striking out on my own. And, you know, I had to lose my health insurance and all these things by quitting that magazine. So it was a difficult decision, but I couldn't stay with something that conflicted with what I now believed. That is beautiful. Great example. Thank you. And uh, my second question is to you, Sam. Why did you choose Emerson? Why, why is it so important for you? Yeah, I, I remember first reading Ralph Waldo Emerson when I was in high school because he's commonly assigned in American literature classes. Yes. And I remember just being amazed by the beautiful words, even though I didn't understand much of it, just his, his way of expressing things and talking about nature and the importance of nature. That made an impression on me. And then in college, I ended up majoring in American literature and studied him a little more deeply. But I didn't really have a personal connection until years later when around 2008, I went through a crisis where I went through a divorce and I had lost my traditional religious faith and my finances were in disarray. As I explained, I no longer had that solid job. I was struggling to find new avenues of work and all the publishing houses were doing poorly because it was the 2008 financial crisis. And it was during that time where I went back and started rereading Emerson and really connected with him personally. And I found that in 1832, he had gone through a similar crisis where his beliefs had changed and he decided to quit being the pastor of the church where he was a pastor. And his young wife died of tuberculosis. So he lost his spouse. And then he, he also had a, a crisis of vocation, or he didn't know what he was going to do with the rest of his life quite yet. And he decided to travel to Europe. And at the end of that trip, he realized that he wanted to become a lecturer, sort of a pastor of all things, you know, not just reading the Bible and talking about that, but looking at all of literature and nature and science and interpreting that for people. So when I found out that Emerson had also had this crisis period of losing his faith and his wife and his job, I could really identify with that. And I found a lot of peace reading his writings. So you found answer in him. I suppose we never, we never find the answer in another person, but they can help inspire us to yeah. find it within ourselves. That was my second note. He inspired you. Yes. And you find some similarity in his life and your life as well. And yeah. the way that he had started having universal will rather than just uh, one aspect of, of life, a religious mm -hmm. perspective, but he started broadening his perspective, so rich in his life. So yes. that's, that's beautiful. And uh, what are those seven, uh, seven principles? What makes those seven principles very important for our lives. Yeah, so to begin the, and explain the origin of these principles. So I told you how Emerson had gone through this crisis, losing his faith, his wife and his job. He travels to Europe and he meets a lot of his literary heroes like Williams Wordsworth, the poet and many others. On the ship ride back, he writes a journal entry where he says, you know, I no longer agree with the traditional conservative religious principles, but people want to know what are my new principles? And he says, well, actually they're not new principles. They're some of the oldest bedrock human ideas. And then he lists these seven ideas. And that journal entry became the basis of my book, Living from the Soul, which you mentioned. Yes, sir. So yeah, going through those seven principles, and I, I paraphrase them for today's readers. I put them in today's language to help people understand them. 
which is crucial. Language is living, living form, and it's always mm. evolving. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that somebody took notice that and updated and brought our attention. So what are those seven principles? Number one, trust yourself. All that you need to grow, all, you, all that you need for growth and guidance in life is already present inside you. It does take some nuance because saying that everything we need is inside us. Well, of course, we do need other people. We need to read and learn things. But ultimately, we have to be responsible for our own lives. We take responsibility for our lives and our beliefs. You know, no matter how many people tell you something, if it doesn't agree with your experience, you're not going to be able to believe that it's not going to work. Like if 100 people tell you the sky is red, but you look and see the sky is blue, it really does come down to our, our experiences. So what Emerson noticed is people would read ancient books like the Bible and other books and say, well, we just have to agree with everything that was written down thousands of years ago. And that's what Emerson uh, came to reject and disagree with. And he said, isn't God speaking to us today just as much as he spoke to anyone 2,000 years ago? We really need to have our own personal experience with spirit and with the world around us. And Emerson noted how when you look at all these ancient books, most of them agree with each other. They come up with the same principles. For instance, uh, be kind to each other, love each other, don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat. Humans naturally come to these things because they're built into the fabric of the universe, and we are part of that. This is our conscience, and Emerson would say, we need to get quiet and tap into our own conscience, listen to that, and follow it. Beautiful. I heard that before too, like one of the main purpose of all religious or, or belief system to settle the conscious in person's soul. Mm. So once you aim that, you already figure out what is, what is good, what is really good. So the, mm. as you sow, you will reap. Your thoughts and actions shape your character and your character determines your destiny. Yeah. Emerson noted that a lot of people think that the universe is unfair and that the bad people prosper <laughs> and, and the, the good people end up poor. And Emerson said, no, actually, every time we do something good, it is rewarded, but it's an internal reward. Every time we act the way we know we're supposed to or think and speak and act in accordance with truth, we are rewarded by growing our character. And at the same time, when we do the things that we know are wrong, then we are punished inside us by those feelings of guilt and such, even if it results in external rewards. You know, even if we get money for it, there is an internal punishment. So Emerson believed that character was the most important thing, growing and nurturing our character. And that, that what we think about will get expressed in our actions. So he says, be careful to choose good thoughts. You know, be careful what you're going to dwell on all day, because that will come out in our actions one way or the other. And as you sow, you will reap. Whatever kind of seed you plant is what you're going to get. So if you're planting seeds of anger and bitterness, you get a crop of anger and bitterness. If you're planting seeds of love and happiness, that's what will come up in your life. Yes, absolutely. In, uh, in behavior term, we call it consequence. Consequence mm -hmm. can be negative or positive, your action. A a again, as you mentioned, it, it's uh, every thought triggers your emotions, emotion triggers the actions, and then you get whatever your action is as an internal uh, reward or it can as you said as it can be look like reward from outside but uh, it can be also and that feeling that eating you alive so yeah. you know, i mean that situation as well so every action we take or we don't take has its own consequence so be mindful about your thoughts and therefore their actions and um yeah Principle three, nothing outside you can harm you. Circumstances and events don't matter as much as what you do with them. 
And this is where Emerson was influenced by the ancient Stoic philosophers. And I know you're, you have an interest in the Stoics and yes, you've mentioned that to me before. My favorites of, of the ancient Stoic philosophers would be Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. Epictetus grew up as a slave and Marcus Aurelius ended up becoming the emperor of the Roman Empire, but he was a philosopher at heart. And what these ancient Stoic philosophers were concerned with was how can we survive and thrive even when bad things happen? You know, life throws all kinds of stuff at us. Are we going to let that defeat us or are we going to find a way to make, make it through and even turn it to our advantage? And Emerson was very influenced by this. So when he says circumstances and events don't matter as much as what we do with them, that's what he's getting at. For me, this really hit home when I was going through divorce in 2008. I had a lot of mental stress and I would dwell, dwell on a lot of negative things. And what I learned from reading the Stoics and Emerson was to let go of things that aren't within my control. We have to look at what's going on in our life and say, okay, is that something I can do something about? And in that case, I... I need to focus on, okay, what is the best thing I can do? But if it's something that there's nothing I can do about it, then we need to find a way to let go of it instead of ruminating on that and worrying about it all day long. Absolutely. You're, I mean, you're right. In, uh, the struggle is, most of the time, it's hard to identify what exactly I'm in control, what I'm not in control. Mm -hmm. So I think that skill is right there, that which one are the ones that I can separate or there's nothing I can do and then, uh, this is the best I can do. So the, that's the line. We're just going to stay solid and make the decision and stick with it. And, um, yeah, and I'll, I'll give you a couple examples there. Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. One, and I don't want to get too much into politics because everyone has their own opinion. I don't want to alienate those who disagree. But, uh, but during the last four years during the Trump presidency, there were a lot of things that upset me. I would go through periods where I would be reading the news so much throughout the day and just feeling awful about it and mad about what was going on. And I kept realizing, you know, I, I can't control that at all. It's totally outside my control. So I need to let go of it and put away the news, stop following that so obsessively. And it was a real struggle, but definitely times where I would get, a, the more I got away from the news, the happier and more content I could be. You know, I also want to share my personal experience on that. And uh, I used to work with, with politicians and uh, I used to write some papers for them as well. Hmm. I personally, I don't follow news. I have my own agenda as just like they have their own agenda. I have my life agenda. I stick with my agenda. So it makes me content and focused and solid. Mm -hmm. So I don't get distracted. Yeah. So and when you, when you look at, well, what is within your control in terms of politics, of course, voting and becoming, in, becoming informed and deciding who to vote for. And then if you choose to become active in some way, Absolutely. whether it's going door to door for a particular candidate or helping get people out to the polls to vote. Those are actual actions that if you decide to take it, that's within your control and it's good to focus on that. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. And I'll give you a, I, I'll give you a second example of this. So absolutely. a couple of weeks ago, my main computer died. The computer I designed all my books on, it just went kaput, it would not turn on. I know how it feels. <laughs> And I had the thought, like, my life is over. <laughs> and, and I thought how easy it is to, to let events make us think, like, oh, it's total despair, you know, there's, and to dwell on that. And then I started to think, you know, no, that's okay. The computer died. That's outside my control. I need to just focus on moving forward what's within my control, taking out the hard drive, sending that out to get the files removed and looking into ordering a new computer. So just trying to calmly work on each step of what I could do rather than get 
overwhelmed thinking, you know, oh, everything is ruined now. Yeah, absolutely. There are two uh, positions you could have taken. You could have played victim and create more mess and also lose time rather than that you recover the, uh, re you make the quick recovery period, staying calm. Okay, what else I can do? Okay, this is done, done. And eventually all the events are neutral. It just happens the way it happens. It happens to all of us. So our mm -hmm. attitude is going to make the difference. Right. Those are beautiful examples. Thank you. Principle four, the universe is in, inside you. The world around you is a reflection of the world within you. And this is a subtle one to understand, but we are all children of the universe. We are, you know, as Carl Sagan used to say, we're made of stardust. This universe created us and all the powers of the universe are within us. And also I would say what, what we find in us is in the universe. So there are some people who would say, oh, this is just a random chaotic universe. There's no intelligence, no love, no anything inherent in it. But we happen to accidentally evolve these traits. And Emerson would say, and I would say, no, because we have love and meaning and imagination within ourselves. That means these are qualities of the universe. These are qualities inherent in the universe. It's not just some accident that happened in us. So realizing that we are children of the universe and what that means, I think is what Emerson is getting at. He also spoke a lot about how the more we learn about the world around us, the more we learn about ourselves. So he was a big fan of science and learning about magnetism, electricity, plants, minerals. He was interested in all of the science of his day because he believed the more he learned about the world around him, the more he would learn about himself because we are part of this world, children of the universe. Absolutely. I couldn't bring the quote from Rumi, Jalalatin Rumi. Mm. Like he says, uh, you are not a, a drop in the ocean. You are in a one drop in an ocean or something like you represent the mm. whole ocean. You know, it's not yeah. you're just one drop. You're like you're representing the whole ocean. So therefore, you are an ocean. So that mm. kind of uh, matches with this meaning. And uh, thank you. Uh, principle five, identify with the infinite. Center your identity on the soul and your life's purpose will unfold. So that ties in exactly with what you were just saying. For instance, if you think of God as the ocean, God or the universe, the life power and life of the universe, that is the ocean. We are like that drop or that, that wave on the ocean or that drop of ocean. So we are pure ocean. We're not the whole thing. You know, it's not that you are the whole God or I am the whole God. It's we are all, we have a spark of divinity. And Emerson said, focus on that spark of divinity, which is our individual soul, which is part of the great soul. Place your identity in that and try to live from that space. And I also want to add this too. In, um, so eventually we are made out, out of a cell. Each cell has its own brain, own system. So we're just population multi-billion of the cell. Mm, and as yeah. one cell actually represents us anyway. In, uh, so that's the biologic perspective. <laughs> mm. I've heard some people say, well, what if we are just cells of the earth? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. When you look from the space, think about it. We look like, you know, like how far you go, of course. And maybe if you go farther, it looks like we are self. We're like moving back and forth. And absolutely. Right. I think that's where it's also important to have some humility and realize, you know, we have this limited human perspective. We're not going to be able to understand everything. That would <laughs> exactly, exactly. We just we're just gonna do our best. We are trying to reach our goal with the least amount of uh, energy, least amount of uh, pain. Mm. So wherever the enjoyment, joy, we're trying to get that with the least amount of uh, energy, also least amount of uh, friction. So mm -hmm. uh, therefore, creating vision, moving forward to vision requires specific characteristics like a discipline, willpower. You just got to keep building those skill set as well. And uh, prior to that, 
if we were talking about uh, awareness, uh, the more we are aware of our environments, the more we get to know each other. So exactly, that's kind of the more we know each other, uh, we're self-aware, and and gives us an options how to see things. So six, live in the present. Mm. The present moment is your point of power. Eternity is now. I call this life is now. Mm. Yeah, even when we're thinking about the past or we're planning for the future, when are we doing that? Right now in the present moment. So it really is all that exists. And it can be good to have times where we remember things from the past and think about them. And it's certainly good to plan for the future, but we really need to focus on enjoying the present moment more rather than dwelling on past and future all day long. That can develop into regret about the past and worry about the future when at this moment, everything's great. <laughs> There's... And when, when we are hurt, when something happens to us, there might be pain in that moment then you pretty quickly get beyond it. The body will heal. But then do you mentally keep dwelling on that pain, like remembering the, that broken arm over and over? That would weigh you down, or you can you know, leave that pain in the past and focus on the present and what's happening right now. I totally agree. It, the, I think the past is important to experience perspe perspective, but the dwelling is absolutely just playing victim very much. You're not taking responsibility. Yeah. The more you play victim, the, that means you're resisting to being responsible for your own life. Mm. So the, the future, yes, it's great. That's the opportunity. Uh, the, as long as it in, inspires you, look forward to the future. But the staying in present, it's the magic. That's the, where the magic happens. You just stay in, uh, in the do whatever you need to do, think whatever you need to think. And uh, yes. I'll tell you, sometimes we think, oh, I'll be happy when I do this in the future or when this happens to me. Like I, when I finish this project or get this person's approval, then I'll be happy. And when we focus on that, we miss the enjoyment in the process and the journey to get there. And then often when we reach that goal, it doesn't even feel like anything. Like it's, oh. It didn't make me happy <laughs> the way I thought it would. <laughs> I'll tell you, this has been on my mind because just a few weeks ago, I reached a goal that I had written down a couple of years ago. And when I reached, I didn't really feel any pleasure or enjoyment from it. And I thought, oh, I thought, wow, I've learned a lesson there. I need to focus on the feeling of what I want to feel and meditate on that on having that feeling now, you know, during the journey and the process, rather than thinking, oh, I'll feel good when I get there. Because if you do that, then you won't actually feel good when you get there. You'll just miss the whole thing. But if you focus on, you know, enjoying the journey, enjoying the process, then you can have that feeling every day. I used to be one of those, like, uh, do, have, and be, right? We operate that way. We do things. If I get, if I do that, if I get that, then I'll be happy. I'll be satisfied. Or if I have that, I'll do that and I'll be happy. So I completely changed that operation system, be and do and have eventually. Because your being, your happiness, your motivation, your inspiration determines, defines your actions. Mm -hmm. And your actions eventually is going to get you whatever you're going to get. But this starts with, as you mentioned, beingness, the, you're just going to decide that. It starts with beingness. Uh, you're just going to decide it consciously. Um, great, great way to put it. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Seven, seek God within. The highest revelation is the divinity of the soul. You know, this was Emerson's belief, and it's something that resonates with me. I don't want to, you know, debate and argue with people who have different religious beliefs, but Emerson noted that Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. And he talked about this treasure within us. And Emerson said that that is the, the realization of the spark of divinity within us and that God is within us. 
And ultimately, we won't find what we're looking for, depending on other people's opinions and accounts or reading books from the past. But we really need to meditate and look within and have our own experience. I was thinking one of the one of the most beautiful stories in the Bible in the Old Testament is Moses has this vision of God in a burning bush, and he asks God, what is your name? And the answer that comes back is, I am. It's such a profound statement, I am, that God is pure consciousness and pure life and existence. So when we get quiet, you know, either meditation or some other means to go within, we can experience that center of I am within us, which is that uh, spark of the divine within us. This is crucial, like I am, whatever comes after I am, it just determines who you are. Like you just gotta, especially mm. when it comes to the verbiage, vocabulary, linguistic, uh, pay attention what you're saying because it really determines right. You know, alters your thought thinking and you know, automatically it's a chain reaction it just you become so well said yeah. and well said okay so we're done with the principles you already on and off uh, share some experiences and so behavior perspective because behavior ultimately is the outcome whatever you're thinking whatever you're feeling it turns to the action Specify certain things like rituals. Do you have any rituals and uh, align yourself, uh, day, your daily life? In what do you do? Like any principles you copy it? Okay, this is my motto and I go with this. Mm -hmm. Can you share some of those, please? Yeah, one of the most important things for me is just reading, you know, and not reading just anything, but inspiring and very edifying books. I think it's important when you wake up in the morning to not jump on the computer or the phone right away or immediately get taken into the distractions and demands of the day, but to take some time by yourself to do some reading. I find that very helpful in the morning. I'm not necessarily able to do it every day. <laughs> Sometimes uh, life gets in the way, but having that quiet time in the morning to read, you know, something by Emerson or something by the Stoics or a new book that I'm reading and learning from. I think that's very important. And then walking outside is very important to me, spending some time in nature. I live in a, you know, not downtown in the city of Nashville, but in the city. So there's there are still trees out, you know, I can, even when I'm out walking among the houses, there's nature with the trees and animals running around. There's a lake about 10 minutes away from me that I like to drive to and walk there as often as I can. Spending that time in nature was, it was extremely important to Emerson. That's where he would connect with his soul and get in touch with the whole universe, you know, feeling that he is part of the universe. That's where it would happen for him. So what is, uh, what is crucial for me? You know, knowing is one side of the pole and doing is the other side of the pole. You seem to be uh, close the gap and, and then mentally and physically you're there. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's just beautiful. <laughs> you know? And I will say most of, my, most of my ideas come to me while walking. So I think walking outside is very important for generating ideas. Now, one thing I do struggle with is meditation. meditation. And that's... That's an important ritual or practice. Sometime I'll, I'll be good at keeping up my practice for a week, at a week or two at a time, and then I'll, I might forget about it for months and fall away. But that's something that I think is very worthwhile, trying to get a half hour a day or so where you can sit in silence or use meditation tracks. That's one thing I've been doing lately is listening to soundtracks. Mm -hmm. For meditation I find that helpful because I'm very impatient when it comes to just sitting in silence let me share my experience when it comes to that point and uh, my thing is uh, along with those work out if I don't work out I'm like boiling while I'm mm. writing and reading something I'm like boiling I have mm. to 
do work out first and it kind of settles me also you know the what the, yeah. the physical activity does in brain so i'm like ready to bring whatever i i have in my mind so it, it just like uh i don't have that urge like a physical urge to move around and it kind of okay I, i'm like completely losing myself okay whatever, whatever i'm reading i'm whatever mm -hmm. writing i'm not a writer like as you are but i take notes and uh so it just that's my trick that I have to do that workout, whatever it is. It doesn't matter what it is. It makes me get going mentally. Yeah, and I think things like things like exercising, working out, that's also a form of meditation because it focuses the mind. And things like singing. I enjoy singing uh, just by myself. I'm a big Frank Sinatra fan. I like to sing to tracks of Frank Sinatra. So that's actually very meditative. It, focuses the mind you enjoy it so whatever your whatever your hobby is or your your passion and talent that can be its own form of meditation finally what do you recommend for our viewers in order to align their daily behaviors to live a prosperous and meaningful life finding some way to meditate or connect with your deepest self like what we were just talking about that that is important Journaling is something that can be important. And Ralph Waldo Emerson was a big journaler. He kept a journal for most of his life. That was very important. You know, writing down your thoughts, inspirations, goals, that can really help you know who you are, help you get in touch with your deepest self. One thing I would recommend that I do every few years is take the time to write a life vision statement for yourself. Sit down and really think about what you want, what your goals are, because most of the time we're just drifting in the current of events and we don't really take time to get clear on what we want. When, when I do this statement, I, I have certain categories like, uh, like romantic relationship, family relationships, job, finances, travel, physical fitness and activities. And just go through each of those major areas of life and write a few sentences on what you ideally see yourself doing. For instance, I'm, I'm enjoying a mutually supportive, loving, romantic relationship. And I recommend that people write this in the present tense, like I am enjoying this. And I am feeling that way. And then after you write this statement, you can then take time to just dwell on that, meditate on, on how that feels and on the emotions. One thing I recommend to people is focus on what's within your control. For instance, for myself, I wrote down, I enjoy singing every day. And when I sing for other people, I bring them happiness. Rather than writing, I'm going to win a Grammy and then I'm going to be happy. So thinking of something like winning a Grammy, that's a dream and dreams are nice, but it's not a goal. It's not something within your control. So when you're writing your life vision statement, focus completely on what you're going to do and how you're going to feel. Thank you, Sam. Magic is actually when you write these goals or vision statements, like somehow your biology supports you and the universe kind of responds to you. Like you start acting towards it and universe uh, starts responding to you positively. Things turn in your favor. And yeah. This whole vision statement process I'm talking about, I give that at the, the end of this book, which is As a Man Thinketh, 21st Century Edition. So at the very end of this book, there's visualize your ideal life, that statement exercise. If anyone watching this uh, reaches out to me, sends me an email, I'll send you that part of the book so that you can do this vision statement for yourself. I would love to do that. Absolutely. That's, that's a great idea. One more question, Sam. Is there a specific time or event that made you aha uh -huh in your life? Like, I'm sure more, there's more than one, maybe, or it was gradual transformation. Hmm. Life is a continuous series of learning experiences. 
And sometimes it's not what we want, but I think our soul needs to lead us through certain difficult experiences to get us to, to learn things, to knock us out of our routine and force us to grow, which can be very unpleasant at the time. But then when we look back on it, we think, oh, that was an important part of my life and it changed in these ways. There was a time six or so years ago when my house was broken into and uh, all my electronics were stolen. And at the time this seemed like a disaster, but then it spurred me on to, it spurred me on to move. And when I moved, I sold my house. I got some, with a bit of profit from that, I ended up recording an album of me uh, singing some favorite Frank Sinatra songs and other songs. Then because of that, I was singing at a particular little cafe in town. And then that's, I ended up meeting my wife at that cafe. So I see how so many things, and even me meeting my wife could be traced back to my house being broken into. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, you know, life throws a lot at us, but you never know how you're going to grow or what good's going to come from that. Sam, I really, really enjoyed uh, this conversation. You brighten our day, my day, and I learned a lot, and I will continue learning a lot from your books. And um, uh, before I say bye to everyone, would you like to share something? I've enjoyed this a lot. And I think just having, you know, deep conversations about important things, that's another thing that's so enriching in life. And it elevates our spirit, elevates our mind, and it, uh, it's going to make for a better day. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.